Hello everyone, my name is Irena Kamara. I'm a researcher at the Tilburg Institute for Law, Technology and Society in the Netherlands and today I'm going to chair this panel uh, discussing outstanding issues uh, for the establishment of the European, the Common European Data Protection Shield and certification. So in 2017, uh, two years ago, I remember there was a panel here at CPDP organized, uh, if I uh, can uh, remember well, from Nimity. Um, and uh, there was a discussion about GDPR certification again. Uh, the introduction of data uh, protection certification mechanisms in um, Article 42 and 43 back then were welcome, welcomed, uh, let's say, with excitement. Uh, about the new possibilities that data protection certification open up for controllers, processors, but also data subjects. Certification was seen as a new accountability instrument um, in data protection law for showing that uh, companies, uh, how they can comply, uh, demonstrate their compliance with uh, their legal obligations. At the same time, concerns were voiced about how the GDPR certifications would be organized on the ground, whether the data protection authorities would align their practices with the ones um, uh, from uh, the existing uh, data protection certification landscape, this is the certification bodies, accreditation bodies, and so on and so forth. The developments and the slow progress around GDPR certifications so far, um, I would say they have rather justified the skepticists. Uh, the Working Party 29 had promised uh, to issue the guidelines on certification by the end of December 2016. In the end, they published the guidelines on accreditation in uh, uh, the beginning of 2018 and later on as EDPB, uh, the guidelines on certification um, in the middle of uh, 2018. But most importantly, uh, what we see is that the European Data Protection Board Register, uh, which uh, is supposed to include all the approved uh, certification mechanisms, seals and marks, um, the approved by the DPA seals and marks, is still empty. Uh, this actually means that there are no approved certification mechanisms to this date. So the system has not started working yet. At the same time, we, we see all kinds of non-approved GDPR certifications out in the market. Some of them are of good quality, some of them are of questionable, even bad quality, let alone DPO certifications that are not even in the scope of Articles 42 and 43. What is clear today, almost eight months after the GDPR started applying, is that GDPR certification, and especially the establishment of a common European data protection seal, are open topics. There is an interest from the controllers and processors to make it work. Certification uh, mechanisms offer regulated benefits. They enable data transfers to non-adequate countries. They help uh, controllers and processors demonstrate uh, the measures that they have taken to comply uh, with uh, uh, their legal obligations. Uh, and, uh, of course, they might be uh, a mitigating factor when a DPA is imposing uh, fines, is considering to impose fines on a controller or processor in line with Article 83. Um, but apart from an inter interest from the industry, um, I should mention that it is also a task for the DPAs to start the engine to start approving certification criteria that are submitted to them uh, for approval, to draft accreditation requirements, and in general, to help with the establishment, to encourage the establishment of uh, data, the data protection certification mechanisms. In parallel, the upcoming publication of the Cybersecurity Act and the certification provisions that are included there uh, they start a whole new debate about the relationship of the two types of certifications that are on relevant, but of course by no means identical topics. Uh, at TILT, we, have, uh, we conducted a study uh, for the G justice and consumers of the European Commission, which aimed at mapping the data protection and certification landscape and coming up with recommendations for the way forward. We looked at certification criteria, we analyzed existing certification mechanisms, we looked at accreditation models, and what we really uh, was the, the main focus was what we can leverage from the existing uh, certification land landscape, but also where 
regulatory intervention and guidance is necessary. So unfortunately, the, the report is not published yet, so I cannot share more on the outcomes and the results of the study, but hopefully it will be published very soon. Uh, luckily, we have a wonderful panel here today with us, uh, with speakers covering a broad uh, spectrum of perspectives and with different backgrounds, uh, which will aim to, to respond to open questions and offer their insights on, on the uh, issues at stake. But first, I would like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Hilke Heimans, who is an independent privacy consultant collaborating with several organizations like the Center for Information Policy Leadership, the Brussels uh, Privacy Hub, uh, and others. So Hilke, the floor is yours. Thank you, Irina. I'm very happy to do this. Uh, what we like to do in terms of process, I would like to make it a bit interactive, so short questions and short answers by the panelists to see how far we will manage, because I know how short panelists can be and how difficult it is for him, them usually to be short. But let me say some words myself first. Um, certification is one of the new things of the GDPR. It's a very promising instrument. It's something which can really, really make accountability and data protection work. Uh, it also means, but it has a lot of implications which make it difficult to, to give it a real good start. Uh, what we li like to achieve with certification, I think in the end, is a privacy-friendly market market that the products are coming off the market which are privately friendly um, but and I also see that many people like to work on it f work on it it's uh, one of the issues which are taken really up in the la first months after the entry of the force of the GDPR but still it's still in its uh, initial phase and I think that has a few reasons why it's so difficult I think the main reason is the ambiguity of the di or the difficulty of the GDPR itself the GDPR made it extremely complex. Those of you who ever tried to read Article 42 and 43, it's uh, the ideal thing to put next to your bed if you have problems falling asleep, because it's, uh, it works. I never tried, by the way. Um, so there is an ambiguity in the, in, the, in the law. It's on the one hand, there is the role for traditional accreditation bodies, certification bodies, and on the other hand, the DPAs themselves who are not used to do certification or accreditation themselves also have key roles. Uh, there is a link with uh, the cybersecurity, where the EU now uh, put in place is putting in place that will be part of the discussions in a moment uh, a system for cybersecurity uh, certification, which is which has some similarities, but is on the other hand completely different than what we have in the GDPR. One of the things of GDPR as well is um, uh, that it's not clear, for instance, whether or not the certification systems, to what extent they should play a role and can play a role in international transfers. I think that's something which is extremely important that it should be because that's the way to bring international transfers further. I'm sure that other panelists will expand on this. And the other issue is the issue that another ambiguity is there is a role for the EU, the EU data protection seal is mentioned clearly in Article 42, but on the other hand, we also see a big role for national data protection authorities and also national bodies. Uh, EU and national, how does it work together? Also, that is quite complex. So, complexity is enough. Um, we see slow things coming up, and I see what we see mainly is that on national level, there is some progress made. I think Luxembourg is the country which is already uh, doing certification, as far as, uh, as I know. Uh, others are, are starting, but we'll hear a lot from others as well. And it's, uh, it, it might be a good thing that, that, let's say, member states start themselves, but in the end, uh, part of certification is, of course, the idea that we create a European market, a European privacy-friendly market. Those as a few starting remarks. remarks. I would uh, like to start by giving the floor to my neighbor, Isabelle Chatelier, someone I know for a long time from the EDPS from before, and but she's now at the Data Protection Unit, Unit C3 of the DG Justice, and she will introduce a few things about purposes 
of a certification and also probably of co code of conduct and how it works together. Uh, Isabel. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> so uh, I just wanted to go a bit uh, backwards to, to look at w uh, these uh, tools that we have in the GDPR. We have the codes of conduct and we have certification. And they have been introduced as tools that organization can use as voluntary measures to demonstrate, to help them demonstrate compliance with the, with the GDPR. So they are part of this toolbox for accountability that the GDPR has created. Um, and uh, they are really great, they have the great potential to uh, facilitate trust, trust from the individuals whose data are processed, but also trust from other business partners with whom the organizations uh, are working. Um, these two instruments, uh, sometimes we are asked, uh, well, they look similar, what is really the difference between them? It's true that they have a lot of similarities, at the same time they also have uh, differences, and I think in the end they are very complementary. Usually codes of conduct are more sector driven, so for a particular sector, codes of conduct are a way to translate the GDPR rules uh, in more concrete requirements so that a particular sector such as cloud computing or health would understand how uh, the, the GDPR rules would work for them. Whereas I would say that for certification mechanisms, the process is driven by certification mechanism authors, standardization bodies or government bodies. Um, and usually they would be more horizontal, they would address um, specific aspects, for example, such as security or transparency in a more horizontal way across sectors. There is the possibility to have certification in very specific sector as well, but I, I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's complementary. Uh, what we see is that these tools are not new, actually, they existed already under the previous Directive 95. There are lots of schemes that have developed. Um, Irene mentioned the study that we have uh, commissioned uh, where they had to uh, actually assess uh, a number of schemes that already operated in the EU market uh, already under the directive. I would say the big difference introduced with GDPR is that they were not, these schemes were not regulated at EU level for the data protection aspects. Uh, so that was left to the member states to decide how they were going to do that. Now a big change is with GDPR. We have specific rules that govern how these mechanisms are implemented and the process for implementing them. And um, as we have seen, this has taken a little bit of time uh, to have them uh, in the market because uh, different, uh, different actors needed to intervene each at their own level in order to facilitate the establishment of these schemes. Um, we have mentioned the role of the data protection authorities, it's very central. Uh, they have to approve the requirements for accreditation, they have to approve the criteria for certification, and I would say most importantly, they had to agree uh, at the European level in the data protection board on what would be the common minimum requirements uh, that they would uh, expect to see both on the accreditation side and both on the content of certification in order to ensure a consistent approach throughout uh, the member states. And this has been very important that they have finally issued uh, their two sets of guidelines on accreditation and certification to set this baseline of common understanding on that. A second uh, important actor has been also the member states, the national legislator. They had, uh, for example, to decide who is going to do the accreditation uh, for GDPR in their member state. They could give it to the national accreditation body, they could give it to the data protection authority, or they could even have a system where both can uh, intervene uh, together. And uh, so this has taken time. Uh, we have seen that the national laws have come only very recently, uh, around May, uh, into place. They are still a f uh, quite a small number of member states that do not have yet their national laws in place. So this is also an important piece of the puzzle for the certification mechanisms to exist is, is also to have this certainty in the national law about who is doing what. And finally, I would also say we are as commission also a big actor 
in, in the field of certification. We have uh, empowerments in the GDPR. We can adopt delegated acts and implementing acts uh, to facilitate the establishment of these mechanisms. Um, and, uh, well, for the moment we are trying to see what the market is coming up with, but if we see that there is a need to um, address uh, a particular situation or to set a more general frame for certification, we may intervene in order to, to, to clarify that landscape. Um, so I will finish on that for my introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel. Uh, very useful. Um, I'd like the floor to give floor to the director of certification policy of Microsoft, so someone who is really an expert, I presume, otherwise. And I would like to ask uh, Alex uh, to expand a bit further on, on, on main elements of certification and also how this works in the, in the global context for a, comp for a company that works globally. Alex. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for all the audience here. Um, yeah, we were really interested uh, in Microsoft about uh, trying to uh, work out what GDPR certification actually looks like for a number of reasons. Uh, first, uh, just to be clear, if there's any uh, entity's business uh, to uh, experience a lot of pressure from their customers uh, to get certification, it would be companies like Microsoft because primarily we are processors for other controllers, right? And in order for us to establish a sufficient guarantee to our customers, um, sometimes just our contract language is not enough. How do they trust us but verify that we have done our part? The only viable way to do a verification is through audit. And through an audit, you get a certification. And this doesn't apply just between Microsoft and our customers. It also applies to that relationship between us and our subprocessors and our co-controllers. And if you think about what the big transaction that Microsoft gone through, acquisition of LinkedIn, for example, um, how do we know LinkedIn's not gonna cost us 4%, right? So there are a number of critical transactions and day-to-day -day transactions where the lack of a reliable way to verify the other entities' uh, uh, its level of compliance is uh, costing us in a daily basis in friction in our transaction. So the sooner we can establish that, the better. So to that end, it's really uh, for us as a, as a market actor, as an entity who would likely have to do the certification, and require a lot of certification from our partners, uh, we'd like to see certain things to happen, such as a uniform uh, baseline uh, certification across Europe, right? If we have 27 or 28 different versions of GDPR certification or more, if in the worst case, you know, that sectorial uh, certification, how would that impact us? Do we have to certify 27 times? That would be, extraordinarily expensive for us. Yeah, we can probably afford it, but what about the small businesses? So are we establishing that to advantage business like Microsoft and disadvantage the small companies? We don't want that kind of uh, market ecosystem to exist. Um, so we, to the end, we really like to have a somewhat a consistent way to as to who would do the certification, uh, who would do the accreditation, uh, what we're gonna certify, how we're gonna certify at least some level of consistency, and that is um, essentially the European Data Protection Seal. Um, we want a scalable system. So we have subprocessors and partners around the world that do not, don't necessarily have a business foothold in Europe, but because of they are subprocessor for us, uh, they process European data subject data, and we, are, we should have a consistent way to do it. So how do we get this to scale beyond the borders of Europe? And in a case of Brexit, I'm sure uh, Willie will talk about, uh, what would happen after Brexit? Right? How would that scale out? Um, can you deploy that? Uh, can an entity outside of Europe easily, just as easily obtain a GDPR certification? Um, so that's important to build upon the uh, ecosystem that uh, talked about earlier is to leverage on that ecosystem. And uh, 
and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that, and uh, I think we have a lot to debate about, and I'll just yield the floor. I'm sure, I'm sure. I hear a lot of questions and uh, solutions uh, we will talk about later. Yes. But let me I'll first with hope. Yeah, let me first take, give the floor to Jelena Brunik. She is head of international cooperation of the DPA of Slovenia and dealing with certification quite a lot. Uh, she will explain a bit about the different options of the GDPR, I think, and then especially the different roles of the certification accreditation bodies and the DPAs, uh, what works best, what works less, based on some first experiences. I also noted, she told me that, let's say, it's, for the, it's a real interesting experience for DPAs because they really have to engage in the mar in a market. And that's something, I think it's uh, quite new for a this kind of uh, authorities. But uh, Jelena, please uh, tell what you have to tell. Thank you. Uh, hi to everyone. So um, I'll just, um, you put me in an unfortunate position. Everyone talks about DPAs and how they're doing and <laughs> how important <laughs> their role is. And of course, of course, I? that's why you have you. <laughs> so let me take a step back. Um, to what the GDPR says, because also the DPAs, I mean, the GDPR um, opened this field of certification, uh, which obviously existed before in other sectors, um, such as security, such as cybersecurity, but now it exists in data protection as well. And the GDPR is a very uh, wide law here, so it kind of accommodates different solutions to coexist, different solutions in certification. And what it did was enable this, the DPAs uh, to play a role of a supervisory authority, of course, but also to play a role in the certification field, so, and take on the role, if it wishes, of a certification body. So if we now take this step back to what the GDPR says, it basically allows for a DPA to, um, to either react on the certification mechanisms that are prepared by the players on the market, that would be certification bodies or uh, scheme owners, and approve the criteria behind those schemes, or the DPAs may create their own uh, schemes and then either issue certifications by themselves or um, outsource this activity, or so there are, there are many, um, many modalities that can coexist. So uh, also the DPAs, we are in a new position with uh, new powers and, and, and possibilities. Some of the DPAs might have experience from before. They were offering certification um, mechanisms or, or, or um, products. And a lot of DPAs do not have this experience from before. And uh, also, they, I, I imagine, such as we, I come from Slovenia, that is quite a small country. And we didn't have, under our previous regime, um, the legislative regime, we didn't have the powers of certification specifically uh, implemented. So we do not have hands-on experience. Uh, with these sorts of things. And um, coming to the first model where a DPA uh, kind of issues, is able to issue certification by themselves, they obviously have to consider how accreditation in their country is um, uh, formulated by the national legislation. They also have to keep in mind their supervisory powers um, and how these connect to the, um, to the new um, tasks of uh, certification. But um, if we turn to the model where the DPA uh, only approves certification mechanisms that come from the market, that would be our model, um, we see that also we are in a specific position. How are we going to approve this criteria? And in this sense, uh, we as a small DPA with um, a limited hands-on experience with approving such criteria, um, are left uh, with, uh, we are left with no easy tools to help ourselves. So in this sense, it is very important, for us it's very important to collaborate with our EU counterparts uh, in the EDPB and to come up with a set of uh, harmonized, um, should I call them criteria on how to approach all these new tasks and powers we have to um, towards uh, certification mechanisms. And it's, it's no easy task. Plus we have 20 and something countries, um, some with experience and some with less experience. And to come up with the documents that the EDPB has come up, 
It is quite extensive and, you know, good work, such as Isabel um, already pointed out, it, it is a big work. Um, so maybe to come back to what you said, the certification under GDPR is quite a puzzle. And it is quite a puzzle also because it's so wide and because it, it, it makes different actors in the field of certification. Uh, it enables them to do things that haven't been enabled before. So I guess it's a learning process. We will all have to learn. And I guess it's, it's, it's the place for the member states to have proper um, legislation in place. And it's, the, uh, it's a role for the DPAs to keep collaborating on the EU level to come to harmonized um, views on what the roles of the different actors are and what the uh, specific benchmarks and minimum criteria should be for the schemes to be approved, right? Um, and also the commission has a role uh, when it sees uh, it fit to kind of intervene and help us a little bit. And then in the end, we, ha we also have the market. Um, if there is no market demand for GDPR certification, then we have nothing to approve, right? So um, let's leave it at that. And again, the DPAs are not in an easy position. <laughs> I understand that. I heard that before. Not only on this subject, but, I, but it's really, it's really the, the truth, I think. Um, Willy Fabricius, who works for BSI, the British Standardization Institute, actually he works in the U US, not in the UK, as I understood, and he works already for 25 years in the area of certification accreditation. So. That's someone we really should listen to from that perspective. Um, as an auditor, I think you worked for a long time. Um, what can we learn from your experiences over all those years in information security uh, uh, certification? That's my question to you. Can you tell me from your experiences how we can, should work in this area? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me on this panel. Much appreciated. Um, one, one thing we need to consider is, um, yes, there are 23 member states, but what is with uh, the 133 countries around the globe that are working on privacy legislation as well? What is with uh, the convergence of privacy principles in Brazil, India, Japan? Would we expect that each of those countries has their own certification? How scalable would that approach be? Um, from our point of view, it's not scalable. And for a company like Microsoft or Apple or Google, most likely that's not an issue. But there are not a lot of large companies on that scale. The majority of organizations are way smaller, but they still would need to get this certification. And one approach would be obviously to have some kind of um, accreditation scheme that allows certification bodies like BSI uh, to issue certificates against those regulations. Um, but the question would be, are these accreditation bodies issuing the accreditation to CBs from country to country different? And if that is the case, would they be mutually ac acceptable so in other words, let's say the um, national accreditation body in Slovenia is approving accrediting a certification body, would then the subsequently issued uh, certificates from the CB being accepted in Germany? I hope it would be, because otherwise that would be a fundamental violation of the European principles, right? Freedom of movement, freedom of business, etc. So the only way we can see is really some kind of mutually acceptable accreditation rules uh, so that the national certification bo uh, accreditation bodies can issue, certificate, uh, issue accreditation to certification bodies, which then in terms can issue certificates to organizations. Um, in the uh, management system world, uh, so ISO 27001, ISO 9000, that's an established process for the last couple of centuries. Um, there is an international accreditation forum that is, uh, for lack of a better word, an association of uh, accreditation bodies globally that accept each other's accreditation and therefore 
uh, certification bodies accredited by one of those uh, accreditation bodies can do business and therefore issue certificates um, around the globe. So um, these are the kind of things we need to consider. Um, you know, a couple of keywords were harmonization. Uh, harmonization only really works well if it is harmonized, if there is a common framework, if there is a common set of rules. And if those sets of rules are common, then there is really no reason to have national bodies doing something different. So, food for thought. This is the next step to harmonize the whole world, but we are starting with Europe. Uh, Andreas Mitrakas is, uh, works at ENISA, he is head of unit there on data security and standardization. And he has a background all over Europe, even in Rotterdam, I heard. So I would like you to explain what you are doing in ENISA, how the new cer cer certification scheme in the cybersecurity uh, area, how that works, because I think it's completely a different model than chosen in GDPR. Indeed, since we are in this um, um, opposing ends of the table, I would like to give a contrasting view. Hopefully it will become complementary. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the thing is that we might have at this stage more uh, questions than answers as uh, the internal market uh, seems to be nothing of what we've um, uh, studied or um, understood uh, to have been in the past uh, 15, 20 years or so when the, this whole framework sta started emerging and shaping up. And the view might be slightly contrasting because besides the implementation of the principles and um, uh, uh, the functionalities for controllers and so on that um, uh, DPAs need to, um, uh, to survey and monitor. Uh, there's also the um, information security element, um, network information security if you like, NIS as it used to be known, or the cyber security as it's more recently dubbed in um, uh, this new instrument, the Cyber Security Act. And uh, uh, there, um, to the surprise or dismay of some, um, there's provision for yet another um, European certification framework, only that this time um, it only and simply relates to cybersecurity. Now, you might say, what's the relevance? But I mean, of course, we know that uh, there's no um, good and dependent and uh, sound uh, data, personal data protection practices or um, privacy protection, if you like, if you want to extend the argument slightly, uh, without um, uh, suitable security measures to, uh, to uh, connect all that, to underpin it. Um, so we have this um, uh, emerging framework. Um, it's uh, likely that within, you know, by the end of this year, uh, the Commission will come up with a whole list of um, um, uh, requirements uh, in um, the form of a rolling work program. Um, and um, lots of stakeholders from um, both public uh, member states and um, uh, private associations and SDOs um, will um, uh, come up to uh, contribute to it. So probably it's, um, it comes in um, as a natural extension, if you like, or if you want to be a bit constructive here, to find ways to approximate the two uh, frameworks. Um, so the cybersecurity requirements foreseen and uh, the framework uh, on certification foreseen in the CSA could somehow find its way into serving the um, certification um, foreseen in Articles uh, 42 and 43 of the GDPR. But is that possible? Because we heard already that um, in the GDPR, the primacy of the initiative and the competence remains with the member states, it remains at uh, the DPA level. Whereas in, um, in the CSA, it's the opposing end. It's the commission that leads the whole process. Um, so again, there's uh, interest from stakeholders to uh, fuel the discussion on uh, cybersecurity. Uh, I believe it's much more state interests uh, that drive the, the discussion in, uh, in the DPA end. And uh, also we have the um, uh, questions uh, that um, uh, Wilbert um, uh, so vividly uh, pictured for us that uh, Regulation 765 of 2008 uh, on C mark on uh, um, conformity assessment bodies and national accreditation bodies, uh, it is questionable whether it applies or not, since the GDPR has been uh, deemed to be like specialists, and uh, then the DPAs might take um, uh, 
um, might, might have a stronger role. Uh, so indeed, from an ENISA point of view, um, we believe that the cybersecurity element is, uh, is quite important. How else would it be? We wouldn't, wouldn't be uh, here, of course. Um, but still, I think the, um, uh, the shiny uh, line behind the cloud is that uh, this uh, EU framework, I think, gives uh, even uh, more uh, firepower to whomever believes that the internal market, when it comes to personal data, can um, uh, be better served uh, by means of uh, both certification options. Okay, thank you very much. A lot of questions we had. I want to go a quick round, quick, quick second round to the panelists again before turning to you as audience uh, with questions, etc. cetera. Um, my first question will be, since we should talk about solutions, would be to, to Isabel. How will the commission help? Will there be implementing acts, for instance, delegated acts? Or how else will the commission help? Thank you for the one million question, uh, <laughs> one million euro yes, question. <laughs> Well, uh, yes, we have these powers in the GDPR. We, we can adopt implementing acts or delegated acts. Um, but we have been looking at that also uh, in the context of the study that we expect to publish uh, in the first quarter of this year. And, um, uh, well, we see these powers as a possibility to accompany this establishment of this scheme. So we still see that data protection authorities, uh, accreditation bodies, certification bodies, they are still in the lead for establishing those mechanisms. And uh, these powers that we have, we may exercise them in order to remedy a situation or facilitate the uptake of these mechanisms if, uh, if we see that this is not the case. Um, another possibility for us is also to use these powers to for example, set a very general frame for uh, certification. So we might, for example, find that um, in a specific type of, um, for specific type of processing operation, we might set the specific, um, some specific frame to, uh, within which the criteria would have to be set. So we can accompany uh, the, the deployment uh, of these uh, schemes, but at the same time, um, we cannot by ourselves define exactly the content, the, the full content of the certification. This is not part uh, of our powers. I understand that. Uh, Alex, I know that you're active in ISO, also with specific uh, privacy-related standards. We discussed that yesterday a little bit. Maybe you can explain how these kinds of new ISO standards can help? Uh, yeah, uh, actually that's a, a standard actually getting near finalization. It's, uh, I'll, I'll give you a number. It's uh, ISO 27552, 27552. Uh, it's uh, near finalization. Uh, and the whole promise of the standard is that it built upon the security standard of 27001, which is uh, one of the most popular uh, ISO standard that is out there um, that thousands of uh, auditors and thousands of companies already certify to that. It's a security standard. So what we do is we built on top of this very successful ecosystem of uh, uh, standards and uh, certifiers and companies uh, and built the data protection requirements. Uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, specific requirements uh, pertaining to controllers and processors, and also enhancement to the uh, tw existing 27,001 controls uh, to cover pretty much all of GDPR in terms of operation controls. In fact, in the standard itself, we have a line-by-line -line, uh, mapping between the standard and GDPR. Uh, the idea is that um, kind of um, piggyback on what uh, Wally was talking about earlier is that in theory you should be able to uh, uh, use this operation set of operation control stipulated by the standard, get certified, and then in theory if you have the mapping done you should be able to do one audit against multiple uh, regulatory requirements. 
in the same time. So if you imagine in theory, say for example, two different nations with two different uh, privacy regulations uh, and they are largely the same, let's just say for hypothetical, that that's 99% the same, that's 1% difference. The cost of implementation and uh, of the compliance and also the audit should be an incremental 1% difference. You should not, an entity should not have to do the work twice, right? You should not do 200% incremental effort in compliance and auditing to, do, to uh, certify against two different regulations that are 99% the same, right? So you want a efficiency to build into your market. And that is really the fundamental behind the standard. And uh, we, in fact, uh, some of the DPAs, including Caneo, was part of the process in defining the standard. So that is our hope. We want to be able to use that to scale it up, to accommodate for variations in the member state level, to accommodate for variance on company sizes and uh, various industries and even different regulations from outside of Europe, for example, California. Uh, so in theory, that is what we're building and this is what we like to consider as a possibility in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, Elena, Elena uh, we, see, we see that the EDPP is helping. Uh, we expect a, uh, the guidelines on certification soon to be published. Um, but of course, there's more the EDPB or DPAs could do. The help, for instance, what, what is needed to get at a certain moment a real European data protection seal uh, arriving or see it coming. Um, so, regarding the European Data Protection Seal, of course there is um, no doubt that there is value in a common approach throughout Europe, but as you can observe from the whole panel discussion, it is very hard to come up to a set of uh, requirements that would be the baseline for such yeah. activity. We are still a family of a 20 and more states and to come up to something that is um, valid throughout the EU and respects the potential specific regulations in the states is a difficult and demanding process. What I would like to point here to also is um, definitely there is value in the European approach, especially for, for multinational companies. Um, that find very great value in that, but there is also value in national um, or local or sector specific certifications that are also enabled by the GDPR because um, you would have uh, companies or businesses um, doing business in a local area, maybe in just one state, uh, maybe in two, and uh, certification could come handy for them too to be able to demonstrate compliance and coming from a market with specific language and you know coming from smaller countries, we do see benefits in that too. So um, the real question is, I think, how to kind of fruitfully um, take advantage of everything that the GDPR offers. So it offers possibilities for national certifications yeah. and it offers a possibility for the development of a European seal, which is obviously a lengthier process. So how to fruitfully combine those approaches, but to still um, hang on to a level that it's going to be harmonized, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, and uh, consistent in application. So uh, in an ideal world, those options would coexist and would um, contribute to uh, higher levels of uh, compliance with data protection rules and create seals that can be trusted that are recognized by uh, data subjects and businesses as trustworthy as based on um, you know, good criteria and strong protections. So this would be the ideal world. The ideal world, thank you. Uh, really, uh, I know that it's about certification, but also about accreditation. I understood that in that, in that area, there is some global cooperation in the global operating forum of accreditation bodies. What role could, he, could they maybe be helpful as a starting point, as a baseline for this whole system? So each country 
or should I say most countries in the world, have a national accreditation body. So there is, for example, the Deutsche Akkreditierungsrat, there is the Rate for Accreditasi, uh, there is ANAP, there is UCAS, uh, representing those individual countries. And the, the fundamental question is, is, if these accreditation bodies are operating in their <coughs> respective country, how much of a value is the accreditation they have given to certification bodies and to ensure that there is this common understanding of rules, um, they have come together at the International Accreditation Forum, the IAF, and created this mutually uh, um, acceptable accreditation mechanism. Uh, it includes rules that the certification bodies need to follow from competency of personnel, to complaints process, to content of certificates, and so on and so forth. And this is the kind of approach um, I think would also work in this context, where the individual member states um, come together and set this common criteria for certification bodies. And if a certification body is accredited by one member state, then that should be valuable and acceptable throughout the European Union. That's the fundamental idea. Okay. Thank you. Andreas, uh, last uh, point, last but not least, I would say, uh, ENISA has this role in cybersecurity certification, but what could be the role, how can ENISA help us to get the GDPR certification uh, rolling? In, indeed, I mean, if, um, um, one, one takes a little step back and uh, tries to build on uh, what's been uh, suggested already. Um, I, I think the picture is quite um, uh, complex as, as, as it stands. So uh, perhaps in a possible approach to avoid um, uh, the um, multiple certifications and um, uh, the um, 28 flavors uh, across member states and so forth would be to uh, perhaps have um, the key stakeholders uh, agreeing that there's um, a, a layer of um, cybersecurity measures, for classical information security measures, uh, which are indeed essential for the protection of personal data. And then maybe you can work for a reference um, 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 scheme, cybersecurity certification scheme, uh, that then the individual member states could draw uh, from and uh, use it uh, back when uh, they put their own uh, uh, fr certification frame frameworks uh, in, uh, certification frameworks in place. Yes, for the purpose of uh, protecting personal data. Uh, m maybe this is something um, a bit too um, uh, hopeful or wishful, um, but still conceptually it is. Um, uh, it, it might sound reasonable. Uh, the, in, in practice, it might be quite uh, quite a challenge, though. Uh, so if. Um, uh, you know, if uh, anybody had an interest in that, I think uh, the starting point should be um, uh, very narrow, uh, very targeted, uh, very specific, and try to deal with information security issues as if they are just um, a very thin layer uh, around uh, the key functionalities that concern us. So. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the floor is yours. Questions, please. Paul Breitbart, and then some others after. Please come and... Thank you, Paul Redbert from Nimity. Thank you for the panel for sharing all your views. It's pretty clear that still a lot of work needs to be done before certifications are really up and running. What I would like to ask you to reflect on is the question of international data transfers based on certifications, because Article 42 refers um, on certifying a processing operation, which implies that it could also be a single processing operation. However, could you consider at any point that certifying a single processing operation would offer sufficient safeguards to meet the international stan transfer standards that we have set in Chapter 5 of GDPR? Thank you. Mark King, a question mainly for the Commission. Uh, in light of the fact that all companies actually have to comply with the GDPR, the question as to whether this is doing anything at all for uh, consumer trust. Uh, I think needs some evidence because in the UK so far it, if the evidence is anything to do it's the other way uh, in 15 years the Commission figures show that the digital uh, signature directive 
the qualified certificates was one user. Now, if one person out of six mil 60 million in 15 years needs it, that doesn't sound like a big market. Um, worse than that, under the government's Verify scheme, uh, two of the providers are in fact the same, but one is white-labeled. The white-label one does not have an appropriate tick in the box uh, because it's using one that does. It's doing very well. The one that has got the official seal is not doing very well. So uh, my question is, not, I'm not denying the fact that it's very useful for, for there to be seals and for perhaps for business purposes, but the question as to whether it has anything to do with, with consumer trust, I think we'd like, I'd like some more evidence, please. Hi, uh, my name is Boris for Swiss InfoSec. Um, first, a question to Alex. You mentioned the ISO 27552. It mentions their application of 2701, 2013, and uh, 2002 as well. 2002 is in the process of being uh, revised, and one is waiting for the question, is uh, 2701 going to be revised as well? Revision is closed. So how is that going to end then, depending on the... Uh, amount of changes and the question to um, who I don't know uh, let's say the whole panel uh, Swiss company we got companies um, dealing mainly with France mainly with Germany etc etc some to differing degrees they want to get some uh, GDPR certification but what do we do don't know what to tell them. We tell them, wait, 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 wait. Uh, C'est la Madame Chatelier, hein? Mm -hmm. <laughs> ah, <ouais. laughs> Hello, Nathalie Lanray from Center for Information Policy Leadership. My question is really to uh, Commission and DPA, and it's a question that has been very clearly phrased by Willy Burt around mutual recognition. How do we make sure certificates uh, delivered by any accredited certification body in Europe is recognized across all member states? And second, how do we ensure that any certification body accredited in one member state can also, be, can also operate freely across the 28, 27 member states? I think we have had quite some questions. Maybe the best thing is to go one by one. Uh, pick up what you want to do, Isabel. You can answer all the questions because it, <laughs> people ask all, everything from the commission. So, but pick what you want to do, and the others will do the other things. Okay. Bon. Um, well, I will start with the, the consumer trust. Uh, well, I think this is the whole purpose of having these mechanisms in GDPR. Is to, um, we have provided these specific rules where the data protection authorities have a key role. They have to select which are the certification mechanisms that they think are really suitable. Uh, they have to uh, accredit, or if they don't accredit, they have to uh, have given requirements for the accreditation of the certification bodies. They will have to meet certain standards uh, in uh, the way that they evaluate. Uh, the, the, the companies going through that. So I think the GDPR has really created a frame to enhance these, that these mechanisms are reliable, that actually they mean something. And I think it, it will come also uh, from the data protection authorities role that they, they will only select the one schemes that are meaningful and they will select, uh, they will try to, uh, uh, with the requirements for accreditation, they will try to make sure that uh, the right certification bodies uh, are carrying this task so that, uh, yes, indeed, this will facilitate the trust of individuals in the end because this is one big aim uh, of having also this, uh, this uh, certification mechanism. Um, for the point on Switzerland, well, uh, I guess they are just like other operators in the market because GDPR says that you can certify if you are based in Europe uh, your processing operations uh, for compliance with GDPR, but it also recognizes that organizations outside the EU uh, can also uh, certify compliance with GDPR, and uh, there are specific mechanisms that, that, that can be put in place for this kind of certification. 
However, I must say we are still looking into that because it raises quite a number of questions on how to design such a certification when we are targeting uh, organizations outside, uh, outside the EU uh, location. So this is still something to be discussed and I know that uh, in the context of, um, of this, of the international transfers and the fact that uh, companies outside the EU would benefit from such certification, uh, there will be more uh, guidelines also developed by the EDPB, so this is still um, a, a pending issue that uh, is being looked at. Um, and finally, on the point of mutual recognition, I must say that one of the uh, difficulty, I would say, is that this, uh, we have this regulation from 2008 that applies to the national accreditation bodies and has organized this system of mutual uh, recognition. Now, uh, the GDPR has not uh, organized such a system of mutual recognition when the DPAs act as accreditation bodies. So, to some extent, accreditation bodies will operate in the context of this 2008 regulation. They have this system of mutual recognition in place because of the legislation of 2008. But uh, the question is more of what happens then when it is the Data Protection Authority being the accreditation body because the GDPR itself has not provided for such a legal framework of uh, mutual recognition. Thank you, Alex. Okay, I'll George. try to tackle them one by one. Uh, on the data transfer question, uh, I think it depends if you have a certification and the scope of applicability of your uh, uh, of the certification includes your global operations. Then I think effectively you enable data transfer. However, if your scope of applicability it's only to I don't know Germany then obviously it's limited to just that. So it can scale up or down depending on your scope of applicability and that's something that you have to decide. You know, if you have a, a unique operation just in Europe just to deal with European data subject or you have a global operations that accommodate all of them. In Microsoft's case, we don't really try to slice it up and down by country by country or region by region. Um, in terms of uh, consumer trust and value, I agree. Uh, it, it, we're not hearing uh, our Xbox customers saying, uh, unless you get a GDPR certification, we're going to go buy Nintendo. It's, it's not happening, right? So I, I, would, I would say in the future, potentially, that could change. Right now, based on all the evidence that we have, we would attribute near zero of our motivation to satisfy our consumer uh, customers. But for business to business transaction, that's the kind of conversation that takes place every day. Um, just to illustrate, we have to, in order for us to sa feel satisfied that our sub-processors sub are, are doing things right, Microsoft because the lack of GDPR certification in the, uh, in the form of European Data Protection uh, Seal, uh, we actually have to ask uh, auditors to do a custom certification just for Microsoft subprocessors. And these subprocessors can only do this audit and get this certification, and it's only good for doing business with Microsoft. It's extraordinarily expensive for them. They charge us back. You, uh, we pay for it and then you pay for it, right? <laughs> so, uh, but this extraordinarily expensive, how would you go do that, right? And then uh, I'll ask, uh, since there's the time limit, uh, 27,001 and two update. Oh. 27, one and, one and two update, we are very well aware of the update to make sure that the change would not upset the whole foundation that is used to build uh, for 27.552. So we know exactly what's going on and if there's an enhancement on the security side, uh, it, we, we knew exactly what's gonna happen. So we're not, uh, I mean, what, how would happen if, if we upset the whole apple cut? So we are very careful about this. Okay. And, then I'll move on because I'm being told to. <laughs> okay. So we got the one minute warning. 
Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll join the two questions on consumer trust and mutual recognition. Um, both are really, really important, obviously. I absolutely agree that mutual recognition is um, one of the crucial points of certification because if you don't have mutual recognition, then a lot of the value of, um, of a certificate is kind of, a, or, or the potential, let's say the potential of a certificate is kind of um, taken away. And it's a challenging how to achieve this mutual recognition with the various roles the actors can play under the GDPR framework. Because if you only have accreditation bodies that you know can mutually re recognize uh, their outputs, it's one thing. If you have new players in the scheme, it becomes very difficult. And to add a complexity, then you have DPAs and certification bodies doing the same things, and they, you know, they need to achieve some kind of mutual recognition. Need to achieve. It would be good if this was possible to achieve. Um, and maybe part of the answer to this question. Um, are the common criteria and common requirements that DPA, uh, the DPAs have been developing in the uh, EDPB, so um, towards certification criteria and the accreditation requirements, which uh, are beginning to show some common baselines. And if we have common baselines in relation to the process and in relation to the context, then achieving mutual recognition is one step closer. And also, these criteria and requirements are um, uh, a thing uh, uh, we can use to, to show uh, that consumers can trust the seals if they are approved, because those criteria are, quite, are extensive and um, set a high benchmark for the approved certificates. And regarding the international transfers, it's a very complicated issue because it involves a completely different area. So international transfers are regulated by the GDPR very specifically. There are specific legal bases that have to be applied there. And um, comparing and contrasting these two um, solutions now is a difficult task, but definitely something um, that we are um, about to do in the future and need to do because it's value in that. For the sake of time, I would like to focus on two questions. First is the uh, acceptance in the market. Um, exactly like Alex said, um, I'm personally not necessarily concerned about the end user, the consumer, but I'm more concerned about the B2B, the business-to-business -business, uh, activities where companies are relying upon uh, companies like Microsoft or whoever. Uh, to have a framework uh, that is accepted and, and certified and not doing it again and again. So that's the, the main thrust uh, in terms of getting market acceptance. Sooner or later, it might be indeed the end user. Uh, second uh, question was related to uh, a Swiss company doing business in Germany or France. Um, case in point, who should they go to? The German authority, the French authority? It shouldn't really matter. Uh, they should be able to choose with whom they want to do business, with whom, by whom they want to get certified, and that certification must be acceptable in the other country as well. Um, thank you. Thanks, Wei Wei. If you, if you want to intervene, it's allowed, but use the microphone, otherwise the registration cannot hear you. Okay, if I want to just um, add uh, You're welcome, eh, but two very brief points, because I think uh, um, um, most have been s said already. Um, uh, the, the, the point is that with, um, um, in terms of consumer trust, uh, the better organized um, um, uh, corporations, they have very limited um, um, problems uh, to comply whatever uh, the legislator or the regulator throws at them. I mean, uh, we heard from Alex, um, and uh, we've also uh, have come across um, uh, similar conclusions when we talk with uh, uh, different stakeholders, especially the ones from, uh, from the United States. However, I think there's more concern for um, uh, these measures when it comes to innovation, when it comes to small and medium-sized enterprises, micro-enterprises in Europe is uh, full of them. So um, following um, on, on this uh, line of thinking that uh, we, we should keep 
things predictable and uh, we use the legal instruments we have in place and so forth, it would sound reasonable to suggest that uh, applying Regulation 765 of 2008, uh, Isabel suggested, and uh, the, uh, the associate standard 17,065 of uh, ISO IEC, it would be the right thing to do. I mean, if um, um, we want to do something uh, differently in the area of uh, personal data protection, it could be just to see what um, uh, particular concerns um, data controllers might have in, in this specific area, but we should not be reinventing uh, the wheel in the sense of uh, organizational measures, legal structures, and so forth. The, I do not see grounds for an exceptionalism in uh, data protection just because it's data protection. That's a good point, Andreas. The last one. I would like to give the last moment, I would give that to Irene. Irene wants, will give a short summary of what we've learned. Yes, thank you. Um, so I, I wrote down, um, let's say, um, four areas that uh, were discussed. First, um, I was happy to see that there were uh, more or less common views on the value of certification along the panelists. So uh, everyone said that uh, uh, certification mechanisms in the GDPR are an accountability uh, mechanism. They um, can help to um, establish sufficient, uh, sufficient guarantees. Um, uh, they can help with a privacy-friendly, uh, launch a, fr a privacy-friendly market. Uh, so I think more or less there is an agreement in, in that respect. Um, but then everyone also acknowledged the ongoing challenges. So there are certainly several needs that need to be fulfilled before these uh, are mechanism are, uh, mechanisms are really uh, operational. So there is a uniform baseline and this is, uh, I think, shared with all the panelists, but, but many of the people that ask uh, questions. So there is a need for a common understanding on, uh, of what is certification and how um, all the stakeholders can work together. There is a need for consistency uh, between the national uh, certification mechanisms and the European Data Protection Seal and how those can work together, uh, being complementary and not competitive to each other. Uh, there is a need also for scalability, and this is something that was not really uh, uh, discussed in depth, but we know that uh, yeah, SMEs also have different needs. I think Elena mentioned it to, to some extent, and there needs to be uh, a, a different um, a measure also taken for them uh, in these uh, certification mechanisms, and this is also a requirement in the GDPR in any case. Um, and we also had several uh, solutions, so it's not everything that is uh, dark and uh, pessimistic. So we uh, can, uh, we heard from Isabel that uh, the Commission might use uh, the, the, the powers uh, uh, after listening to, to what is happening in the market uh, and what are the needs in practice and the demands. The Commission might use the powers to adopt implementing and delegate delegated acts, um, and as, Isab as Isabel said, to set a general frame um, to accompany the deployment of certifications, but not determine the, com the content because this needs to come from the market. Uh, we heard from Alex that standardization can also offer solutions, so the new standard uh, developed by ISO and IEC, um, it was uh, very encouraging to hear that there is a mapping to the GDPR, so this is something new uh, also that might be quite useful. Um, and also, we heard from uh, Willy that uh, uh, with regard to accreditation, uh, we already have the experience that we can follow from uh, other fora like the International Accreditation Forum. So uh, there, is quite, there are quite some lessons to be learned uh, from that experience as well. Uh, and of course, when it comes to, to cybersecurity certification and the NIS um, uh, directive, uh, information security certification has been existing for many years now. So there are also um, uh, some common areas that can be complementary to uh, GDPR certification as well. 
And of course, there are many issues like data transfers. It is it's an, a very important topic. And uh, we heard the DDBB will uh, plans to adopt guidelines, specific guidelines on that issue. Uh, but uh, as I as I from everything that I heard, I think the most important thing is to find the common forum for all stakeholders to be able to talk to each other and share their experiences to make this uh, certification mechanism uh, really work in practice. And uh, I would like to thank all the panelists and our moderator and the audience. And thank you very much for, for your attention. Uh, and enjoy the coffee break. Thank you.